All right, hello everyone. So in this video, we're just going to continue working with our <clears throat> Edmonton single family uh, housing price data set. And in the previous video, we had just implemented a very simple four month moving average forecast. And in this one, we're gonna introduce some error measures that we can use to help get some values out of the model so that if we were to compare it to others, we'd have some kind of you know, relevant way of comparing the models to determine which one we think is performing better. Um, and then we can make a decision to go with one value over another. So let's go back and revisit the data here. And here's our forecast value that we came up with uh, in the last video. Again, it, it, it's far off from what we would see here. But again, we're just dealing with moving average values. We're, so we'll have a another visual look at this data once we're finished here. But for now, don't worry too much about this value. Again, like I mentioned at the very beginning, there are a number of different factors at play here that would potentially influence the actual value. This is just one piece of that larger picture. Um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of these error messages from the last time I kind of left them, but they're bothering me now. So let's just ignore those errors. And so what we can do to start to inspect this model to see how it's performing a little bit is really just compare our forecasted values against the actual observed values, right? At the end of the day, we're trying to make a model that can predict into the future. And so for the actual periods for which we have observations, we can test to see how well this model is performing with the values that we have already here. So what we need to do this is uh, a couple of additional columns that we can use to track the errors between our forecasts and the actual observations. So let's just go ahead here and create some additional columns um, up here at the top. And so what we're going to track here are the actual errors in our forecast to the observations. So they could be either positive or negative, right? Our forecast value might be greater than the observed value or might be less. So that's what we're going to track here. And then we're going to track the absolute deviation. So regardless of, of direction, we just are interested in the magnitude. So if it was negative 100 or positive 100, we just care that we were 100 off the mark. And then finally, we can get a relative percentage error that we can use to compare the overall relative error in the model itself. So let's here beside the forecast, create a column header for the error. And then we want to track the deviation. And then we're going to have a look at the actual relative percent error. We can format this up a little bit too. There we go. All right, so the first observation for which we can determine the error is for our first forecast value here. And this is going to be pretty straightforward. It's just going to be our forecast subtract the actual observation. So we can just say here this is equal to D9, and we're going to subtract our observed value in B9. And so we can see here that our forecast was actually 3,300 higher than the actual observed value. All right, and so once you've calculated that for one uh, period, you can just use the fill handle and pull that down across all the remaining ones. And so you can see at a glance here numerically kind of how our, our, our forecasts are doing. So we start off a bit high, and then they kind of normalize here, and then we're a bit low, and then we're high again, and then we come back and we're extremely low. So this, this indicates that there are some kind of, you know, what I'll, for lack of a better term, call micro trends in the actual observed values. So we could see here that they're decreasing because our forecast is is high. I know that the observed values are continuing to go down. And here where the the error is in a negative, I can tell that there's a trend in the upward direction because our forecast is is always behind the actual observed values. So that, that's not always obvious just by looking at the numbers. So it's good to visualize it, of course, but that's just a, an initial takeaway that we can see here. So 
And then we can move on to the deviation. And this is just really the absolute value of the actual error. So regardless of direction, we just care like how far away from the actual observed value our, our forecasted values were. And so we can just use the absolute function or ABS um, to do this. So this is going to be the absolute value of the error that we had calculated previously. And so once we have that, we can use a fill handle again and drag that down. So we'll just see we're really getting rid of direction and we're only interested in the magnitude. And then finally, what we're interested in in the final column is the relative percent error. To calculate the percent error, we just take our deviation and we put that against the observed value. So here we can just say it's equal to our deviation divided by the actual observed value. And so that's going to give us a decimal value, but we can convert that to percent. We might even want to be explicit about that so we can increase the decimal places. And then again here we can use the fill handle to, to drop that down. And so now we have some additional error measures that we can use to see how this uh, model is performing. And you can see um, that in terms of like overall variability, we're not like cr crazily out there. It's not like, you know, tens of percent off the mark. Um, but when the fluctuations are as slight as they are, uh, and we can see here, these, these uh, magnitudes, sorry, here, th they actually look much larger than they appear in terms of the relative percentage. So again, these measures are useful insofar as, you know, you can inter interpret them in different ways, but how you want to interpret them and which ones you give more weight to is really dependent on, on the context. So this is kind of the first phase of collecting these values, but they don't really say anything overall. We can kind of see per observation and forecast how it's doing, but we really want to have summative accuracy values that we can use to talk about the model um, in general. So for that, we can look at three different accuracy measures and uh, a fourth, which is really just kind of a, a twist on one of the three um, that are useful, okay? And so the, the first uh, accuracy measure that we want to introduce, and we'll just put these over here um, to, the, to the right, is gonna be the, the mean absolute deviation. And so what we want here is just the, the the mean average of the absolute uh, deviation of errors that we can see here. So we're just going to basically get the average magnitude that we were off over all these, these periods. And, and if you were only interested in like, you know, the last five observations or something, you could scale this down to only include the values that you want, but we'll go ahead and we'll use all of the values that we have in this particular case. So this is just going to be equal to the average of these deviation values, okay? And we can clean this up and format it a little bit so we can see what the, ab the, the mean absolute deviation is. So again, you can see here in some cases there was no deviation, in others it was quite high, and the average is 2,312. And so that, that in itself can be useful. Um, in general, we could look at this and say, hey, you know, on average we're, we're off this much. Now, this doesn't give us a percentage error. We have that as a separate uh, measure. But uh, again, depending on the context and the data you're looking at, this may prove prove useful. The smaller the value here, obviously, the, the better. And so um, another thing that we can do is we can see here that we've got a number of kind of smaller and then in some cases quite large compared to the others um, in deviation magnitude uh, values. And... And so taking the mean average of the absolute deviation is one thing, but it kind of treats all of the, the deviations on the same level. And so that, that's fine in some cases. Again, it depends on what you're looking for. But in, in certain cases, you may want to identify where there were extreme outliers. So if we had some of these errors that were extremely large compared to the others, we may want to weight those more heavily. And so what we can do is we can square those, those errors and then we can sum them together and get the mean average of the sum of the squares. And so that, again, is, is useful for two things. One, like the mean absolute deviation, rather than having to calculate the absolute values, when we square values, we don't have to worry about doing that. We could, we could just take the initial error values and square them. And then, 
again, larger values are going to increase in size far, far more than we would see smaller values. And so those would more negatively impact the error or accuracy measure um, overall. And so we can create the MSC or the mean square errors. And th there's a, a way to do this. So we can use the function, which is sum SQ, which again, sums the squares. And in this case, we want to sum the squares. Again, you could use error or deviation. It doesn't really matter. Um, but we'll go with the error values. And then we want to divide this to get the mean average by the number of, of observations in, in our selection. So I'll just put that in first. So you can see the sum of the squares is quite large. But we can see here in our, our values, we've got 21 um, that we have account for. So we can divide this value by 21 to get the mean average of the sum of squares. Oops. Maybe if I put the actual numbers in, that will help. 21. Okay, so this is a, a extremely large value still. So it's not relative to our, our values that we're looking at in context. But again, if we had another model, let's say we had a, a, a three month moving average model, we could use this value in comparison to that. And again, here we're looking for lower is better, right? So it's not necessarily the overall value that we're interested in. It's when comparing models, do we have a, a low value versus a higher value? One way to bring this back down to relative terms would be to take the square root of this value, and that is called our RMSE, or the root of the mean uh, square error. And so that's just simply going to be equal to the SQRT of this value that we calculated above. And so now we can see that it's a little more in line with the measures and the deviation that we see here. Because of these larger magnitude errors, we can see that the root mean square uh, of errors is higher than the mean absolute deviation. So again, the, you know, it's not to say that RMSE is a better measure than the mean absolute deviation. It really depends. Um, are you interested in more in the frequency of the deviation? or Are you interested in the absolute deviation from results in, in general? Um, and those are two different questions that you may have to answer. You're not going to have to answer them um, in any of the the assignments that I've got for, for my courses, but it's something to keep in mind. And then finally, we can look at the mean um, average percent error. And this is based on the average of the percent errors that we've obtained here. So here we can, we can use an average. Oops. Of these values. And we can see the overall. So we have some that you know are are quite high, and some that are a bit low. The average percent error is a 0.62 percent. And so now that we have these measures, if we were to produce um, an additional moving average model that we wanted to compare against this four month, we would have some accuracy measures that we could use to make that comparison. So really simply. Let's just copy everything that we have here. I'm going to just control C, copy this, and I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to paste it below. And what we'll do is we'll create, instead of a four month moving average, let's create something a bit smaller. Let's create a three month moving average. And, and, and you could do this multiple times. You could have four month, three month, you know, five month, whatever, but this will get the, the point across. And so what we need to do now is since we're only dealing with a three month moving average, we need to update how we've c come ab about getting these average and forecast values. So in this case, it's not going to be a, a four month moving average. It's going to be equal to the average of the three months prior. And so we can, let's format that. So we can use the fill handle and drag this down. So now we're dealing with three months instead of four. We can ignore this error. And then this average becomes the forecast in the fourth period, which we can indicate by setting this cell equal to that one. And then the same thing, we can use our fill handle and we can drop that down. And our measures should have just updated automatically. We don't have measures for this new one that we've, we've got here, so we can just select these and kind of drag it up. And then I'll just format these. Um, so we've got no decimal places. So once we've made this adjustment, so we had a four month moving average above, now we have our 
our three month moving average. So, so a shorter uh, window that we can slide over the, the, the data to get our forecast and we can compare these forecast values. So this one is marginally higher than the previous, but how do we compare? We, we can look at these values and see that they're different, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this one is, is better. Um, what we can do is look at our accuracy measures and compare the two. So for example, oh, I'd put this just out of reach. Let me delete this. There we go. So if we look at our four month moving average, the mean absolute deviation was just over 2,300, but our mean absolute deviation for a three month moving average is under 2000. So in terms of this accuracy measure, the three month moving average model is performing um, marginally better. And then if we compare the remaining values, I'll skip over, M over MSE, but we look at our MSE, you can see it's dramatically lower as well. So it's performing better in both the absolute and the root mean of square errors. And our mean absolute percentage error is also marginally lower. So when we compare these two models, I'm not necessarily looking at the forecast value to make a determination of which one is better. I actually have these, these accuracy measures that we can use now to kind of speak the same language when comparing one model to another. And so that's all there really is to simple moving averages. Um, and really all we're doing is placing a weight on the previously observed observation values in order to determine the, the latest forecast value. And one adjustment we can make to this model is we can add in a smoothing factor, which essentially enables us to place more or less weight on the most recent observation or most recent observations, plural, uh, in order to adjust or um, take into account minor kind of trends in the, the observation data that we have. So that's what we'll do in the next lesson is we'll explore creating exponential smoothing um, variables for our moving average models.